Hi, this is Catherine, and this is Taking Tea with Catherine. This is English Rose Tea from Wittard of Chelsea, which is in England, <laughs> a British tea company uh, established in the 1800s. So I thought it might be fitting to talk about something related to Victorian items. And also roses seem to have a lot of feature in the Pre-Raphaelite. Hard word to say, Pre-Raphaelite. I always thought it was Pre-Raphaelite. And then I heard it pronounced by some English people and thought, okay, if they know how to say it, then I guess I got to go along with that. So anyway, that's what I'm talking about today. Um, I'm doing just a video. It's a kind of an overview. This is not an art history discussion. This is not scholarly, really. I like connections. I love to see how things connect with each other. And I love the Pre-Raphaelites. I, well, I don't love the people themselves sometimes. They can be a little annoying, some of them. But the paintings I really enjoy. I like reading about their lives and about the subjects of the paintings, etc. So I do plan to make more videos about the Pyrophilites in the months or year, however it turns out to come. But I thought today I would just do a little overview. And this is not extensive. There are probably going to be things that I will have left out that were um, definitely part of this discussion. And if you can think of anything, feel free to mention it in your comments because I love to learn as well. Um, <clears throat> but I'm talking about the connection between the Pre-Raphaelites and Victorian literature. They have a lot to do with all kinds of literature. Medieval, um, a lot of Dante, Shakespeare, the Bible. That's not medieval, but you know what I'm talking about. But definitely there were a lot of connections, and which makes sense because they were a pretty well-known group in the Victorian era. And the... Um, of course, they might have come across some actual writers of Victorian literature. And uh, so these are just some of the connections. Now, you may say, who were the Pre-Raphaelites? And, you know, sometimes I just assume people know, but that doesn't actually make sense because personally, I didn't know who they were until I was about 30. And so I'd seen some of the paintings, but I never made the connections. I blame the fact that I've always been a pretty regular attender of uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I do... I do enjoy paintings, but we didn't have a lot of Pre-Raphaelite art in New York. So yeah, didn't get, didn't run across it a lot. And then it was brought to my attention a little more. Obviously I'll get into that maybe in another video one day, but, uh, since I would say since the, uh, I don't know, mid two thousands, I've been very interested and have read a lot of books, both history books, art, art history books, studies, and even biographical fiction, that sort of thing, about these uh, artists and their models. But um, they were a group of quite talented people, and there were there were about three who were like the main founders, but it branched out. There were more who joined them, and there were more who were influenced by them. Some became known as Pre-Raphaelite painters, some just did some paintings in that style. Some of the Pre-Raphaelite painters didn't necessarily paint only Pre-Raphaelite paintings, but I, I kind of include everything in here. So um, I'll just read this one uh, portion of this book that I have called The Lives and Works of the Pre-Raphaelites um, by uh, Michael Robinson. So pretty, right? Big paintings. Uh, lots of redheads. <laughs> um, when I was, when I had red hair uh, a few years after I got into them, this was definitely an influence, let's just say. But that's not what we're talking about today. So this little part in the introduction says, A Brotherhood. In the autumn of 1848, a group of like-minded artists, John Everett Millay, William Holman Hunt, and Dante Gabriel Rossetti, met in London to discuss the rather lax style of traditional academic painting espoused by the academy schools, a style that began in the period following the high Renaissance painter Raphael. Uh, they blamed such laxity in Britain on the advocate of this approach, the first president of the academy, Sir Joshua Reynolds, referred to them later as Sir Sloshua. I like Reynolds' paintings, but I understand. Uh, in its place, they wanted a lighter tone to the work that would dazzle in its freshness. This was an agenda for changing the face of British painting forever. They proposed a brotherhood that would infiltrate the academy and change it from within. There was a certain naivete in their ambitions, providing a number of heroes, both real and legendary, that could appear in or inspire their works. They included such diverse figures as Shakespeare, Dante, Jesus, Chaucer, Keats, and King Arthur. Another four members were recruited to the Brotherhood, 
William Michael Rossetti, a poet and brother of Dante. So already we got literature here, a poet. Frederick George Stevens, a painter and art critic. James Collinson, a painter and the only sculptor of the group, Thomas Warner. So those were the early Pyrophilites. And um, you've already probably heard the name mentioned here, Rossetti, a couple of times because the main founder and the brother. But let's not forget another connection that I call what I call the original connection that I know of, because this is the first uh, one I had heard of, which is Christina Rossetti, the sister. We had read um, some of her poems when I was in um, sixth grade in school. So that was my first introduction to the, this group. So that's already one connection to Victorian literature that we have here. Um, another connection was one of their big advocates, a writer who wrote about art, who wrote about architecture, who lectured, who was a bit of a windbag in my opinion, but in, you know, took an interest in them and was very um, important to their uh, growth, who was John Ruskin. And uh, he was, yeah, so I did read one of his uh, books or part of one of his books for Victober a number of years back. It, it, it can be a little much, but I, I'm glad he was their champion. He actually was married to um, somebody who ended up leaving him and marrying John Everett Millay. So that must have been a bit of a scandal, but that is another connection. Um, Millay is actually my favorite Paraphalite, and there's reasons for that. One reason is that I happen to like a lot of his paintings. The Ophelia painting uh, is a very famous, a very famous one that I don't have on hand, right? Well, that's, yes, I do in this book right here. Let's look at this right here, the top one. You see it? I really need to learn how to do slideshows. But anyway, uh, the Ophelia painting is one of my favorites, but um, a lot of his subjects were amazing. And I also just personally like him as a person a little bit more than, say, Rossetti, um, whose life was extremely interesting, but sometimes he's just so frustrating. But anyway, um, but Millay was interesting in that uh, you know, some people might call him a sellout because he did later on do a lot of uh, drawings and paintings for, you know, commercial um, appeal. And I don't have a problem with that. To me, yes, one must, oh, it's good tea. One must make a living. And because he produced so many amazing Paraphalite paintings, I'm like, you know what? Go off and do what you want. Especially if you are going to illustrate and paint for Anthony Trollope literature. So that to me is one of the biggest uh, draws to him. And you will see I haven't made as much progress as I would like so far this month in Orly Farm. But this is a Malay right here in the cover, which is also another connection I'm going to say in uh, Victorian literature. A lot of covers of Victorian novels have Pre-Raphaelite paintings or people who are influenced by them. This is called Trust Me, Trust Me. Um, and I sadly don't have the edition that I would like. And I'm one day, if I ever find it, I will, I will get it, if, if not completely out of reason uh, monetarily. But Malay did a lot of illustrations. Um, if you ever look at the Trollope Society's website, you can actually buy um, greeting cards and things, postcards with some of these illustrations with the characters from both Orly Farm and uh, I think Friendly Parsonage. Or, anyway, a few other Trollope. Trollope uh, novel. So that's to me one of my favorite connections, of course. Um, uh, Trollope, of course, must have liked Malay quite a lot. Uh, he's the, one of the more popular, I should say more popular, Trollope is popular enough, but you know, more well known now to us, except for those of us who are into Trollope. Um, you know, Victorian writers, I mean, if you're going to think of probably one of the first ones that come to mind is Charles Dickens, who I do not knock. I just, I love, I love Charles Dickens as well. He was not a fan. He was not a fan of um, the pre raphaelite paintings, particularly one, I believe it was called Christ in the House of His Parents by Millay as well. He called Mary, this, as a, one of the subjects in the painting, ugly. So that's nice. The pre raphaelites were sometimes quite realistic in their paintings. Some of them are very color, highly colored and beautiful um, as well, as you can see from some of these, uh, some of the little things I've shown you already. But yeah, she wasn't, she wasn't that, you know, gorgeously um, virginal looking um, subject in that particular painting. So I guess he wasn't a big fan, but I am. And one of his daughters actually, I believe, was her name Catherine? I'm not sure. One of his daughters actually did sit for Millay for at least one painting. Might have been a portrait, but still, it's, it's a connection. Let's see, I'm looking at more connections. Okay. Give me a moment while I find this book 
I have piled all these books on top of each other. I have so many books for the pre-op life. It's disgusting, but it's lovely. I enjoy it. Another person influenced by the Pre-Raphaelite painters was Charles Collins. And he was the brother of one of my growing favorite novelists of Victorian times. And yes, you guessed it, Wilkie Collins. Love, love Wilkie Collins um, so far. And uh, this is one of Charles Contents, Contents. Charles Collins paintings. Yes, I am getting my thoughts together. Convent thoughts. Do you see it? It's rather interesting. It's rather kind of pretty, but thoughtful and quite Catholic. And that is another connection, weirdly enough. They were connected with the Oxford movement. Some of, some of the paintings that they were commissioned to do, Rossetti. I wonder if Rossetti was, might have been Catholic. He was a, um, he was definitely um, of, of an Italian background. So it's possible. I can't remember for sure if he was born Catholic. I'll have to look into that again. But the, um, the Oxford movement, the Anglo-Catholic movement, there was just a number of uh, Victorian uh, heavies, you know, people who were slightly well-known at the time who were either converting to Catholicism or just somehow connecting to it in some way or another. And in that, in that way, um, we have another, I don't have the example right here. Um, I don't want to say Google it because I hate making you do the work, but um, one day I'll have a picture of it. But um, Millet also painted John Henry Newman, also known as Cardinal Newman, who also um, converted obviously to Catholicism. He wrote an I think it's an idea or the idea. I think it's an, an idea of a university. Don't quote me on the exact title because I, of course I forgot to write it down. Um, so that is another piece of Victorian literature. It was more of nonfiction, but still an important piece of writing of the time. And uh, one of the reasons I enjoy bringing that one up is because I would not have even heard of this writer and this, this writing if it hadn't been for the fact that it was one of the books requested by Helene Hanf in 84 Charon Cross Road. Now that is of course a connection that is not necessarily Victorian, but the book itself is. So yes, another connection. I'm getting way too excited about this. During that time when, um, when Rossetti was involved in painting in Oxford and he got, he got involved with um, other painters and artists that were quite, I would say enamored of him. They were, they, they hero worshipped him in some ways, but also, you know, eventually they got to know him a little better and realized he had his issues. But they all remained in touch for a good portion of their life. And uh, I'm not going to give every name of everybody who is connected to, with the Priophilites, but one of these people is William Morris. Yes, he, of course, is even more well known nowadays as <clears throat> one of the main founders of the arts and crafts movement. There are a lot of discussions about that that I'm not going to get into right now. I believe, if I could find the connection, I think it was mentioned quite recently, I believe Kate Howe did a video about the arts and crafts movement. So that is definitely um, something to look into. But he was also a novelist. So I have here a book that I have not read yet. That's why I don't want to discuss it too much here. But it is definitely written by William Morris. And it's called News From Nowhere. Look at the design. I found this at a Strand kiosk um, outside Central Park. Nothing to do with Victorian literature itself, but I don't know. I just love to mention things. So this is a goal of mine, a TBR, shall we say. And now let's talk about a painter who did some paintings in the Pre-Raphaelite style. Um, I don't think strictly, but this was just one of the influences he did. But this is one of his most well-known and pretty amazing. And then his name was Henry Wallace, The Death of Chatterton. So... The, I believe the story is, and it's been a while since I read this story, but um, I believe Henry Wallace ended up, is it him that cheated on George Meredith's wife while, they, while he was painting him? Something along those lines, but, which was an inspiration. But anyway, let's look at this painting here. This is one of my favorites. I actually um, had a friend of mine many years ago uh, painted, not painted, took a photograph of me in this style. I, if I ever find it again, I'll pull it up for you and show it on my, I don't know, Instagram account or somewhere. But um, I think it's a pretty cool painting. It's a sad one. It's a it's a painting of a poet that died when he was like 17 years old. Of course, this is pre-Victorian, but you may say, why are you talking about this? Well, as mentioned before, the model, shall we 
show him again. Here he is, the model for the death of Chatterton. For Chatterton himself was George Meredith, the writer, whose writings I cannot find myself finishing. <laughs> I don't know what it is about his books, but um, The Ordeal of Richard Feverell, The Egoist, I've started, I've sat there and felt near tears trying to continue. Maybe one day I will move myself to actually get through one of his books, but there are too many books I want to read instead, and I do not want to make my reading a labor, if pos, um, unless it's a labor of love, which it isn't quite so, but still a connection, a major connection, a, a novelist who was a model for a Pre-Raphaelite painting, right? Let's see, I'm looking at everything I wrote down and I want to get very thorough, of course, Millet and other pa pa um, painters of the Pre-Raphaelite style were influenced by Tennyson, but as I haven't been reading much about Tennyson re recently, I'm not going to get too thorough into that another time, another thing to look forward to. Um, I started reading a book by Charlotte Young, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to get into this writer, I think she's good, um, but you know, just haven't gotten that far in her book yet. But <clears throat> I'm only mentioning this because I don't know much about it. But when I was reading the about the author in this in this uh, in this particular copy, it talks about um, let's see when it talks about where she was born. She became a leading apologist of the Oxford movement, which I mentioned recently, the high church faction of the Anglican Church. A prolific writer, her work was always read and vetted by her father. Blah blah blah, um, and money she earned was donated to good causes. She influenced the Pre-Raphaelites, and in her day was even more popular than Dickens and Thackeray. So this is actually something I only just read and uh, of that description, so I don't want to get too far into it, but I want to someday get a little further into it, and if I do, you will hear about it. How did she influence the Pre-Raphaelites? Maybe just her stories were inspiring, I don't know. But either way, I think that was a cool connection. Last but not least, a couple of years ago, I read Lady Aud Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, and, uh, which was a fascinating, interesting, sensational type book, which I actually do recommend that you read if you have a chance to. But this part really, um, early on, in, the, in, in here it's page 69 um, in the story, suddenly I came across this passage. My lady's portrait, Lady Audley, my lady's portrait stood on an easel covered with a green baize in the center of the oct octagonal chamber. It had been a fancy of the artist to paint her standing in this very room and to make his background a faithful reproduction of the pictured walls. I'm afraid the young man belonged to the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, for he had spent a most unconscionable time upon the accessories of this picture, upon my lady's crispy ringlets and the heavy folds of her crimson velvet dress. Going on to the next page, a few paragraphs later, it says... Yes, the painter must have been a pre-Raphaelite. No one but a pre-Raphaelite would have painted, hair by hair, those feathery masses of ringlets with every glimmer of gold and every shadow of pale brown. No one but a pre-Raphaelite would have so exaggerated every attribute of that delicate face as to give a lurid lightness to the blonde complexion and a strange, sinister light to the deep blue eyes. No one but a pre-Raphaelite could have given to that pretty, pouting mouth the hard and almost wicked look it had in the portrait. So this is a little bit of an introduction to this character and who she is and how she is portrayed. And this is a slightly not as positive um, judgment of the Pre-Raphaelites, but it's, it's quite an important part of the story or one important part of the story. So I thought I had to show you that connection. It, it really excited me when I was reading it. I was like, oh my goodness, they're, they're mentioning the Pre-Raphaelites. So I would really recommend, if you want to learn a little more about them, to look up a little bit more about the Pre-Raphaelites. There's so much about them. They're doing an exhibition in the Delaware um, Museum of Art, which I hope to get to, about the Rossettis. And uh, if so, if you are in the United States and can get to that, you will see something actually in the United States. They actually, Delaware tends to have a good collection, much better than New York. Last year, they had a few of Malay's paintings on, on loan, and I was quite excited about that. But I digress. Anyway, you may look at these paintings for yourself and feel quite like this writer, maybe a little bit lurid, maybe too much, too much emphasis on texture and ringlets and so forth. I like this sort of thing. I like the emotions it inspires in me. I like getting a little bit of emotion inspired in me altogether. But that's not really what we're talking about today. Like I said, this is just a little bit of a discussion of one connection that I really enjoy. I thought I had to share it during Victober. And I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. I hope you um, will feel both inspired to look into the Pre-Raphaelites yourself 
inspired to look into these writers yourself. There's so many that I mentioned that I tend to mention a lot, but I just love, I just love this sort of thing. So I hope you do too. If you like this kind of discussion, please like and subscribe. Um, if you like to talk about such things and if you have anything further to add or just an opinion, please comment below. So this is all for today. Thank you for watching at this point. This is Catherine at Taking Tea with Catherine. Have a lovely tea, book, and pre-Raphaelite filled day. Goodbye.